Good day, Math 30-1s. Last day we begun a conversation about exponential functions and we really learned how to graph things in the form of a times some b to the power of x. Where b was your base and if this number was greater than 1 we saw the function do this increasing shape. If the function had a value between 0 and 1, like 1 half or 1 quarter or 0 0.9, we saw it do a bit of a decreasing exponential function. So exponential functions can increase and decrease, but what we do like at today is this idea that we could actually do some vertical stretches, maybe some shifts, maybe some flips, and with that we have a new standard notation for transformations. A good reminder too that when we're dealing with an input, that's your exponent. Anything in this exponent position is affecting your input. So when we're talking about uh, the effect on x, the horizontal effect, that all goes in there. y is still your output, x is still your input. And in terms of the other parameters, c is not going to be a parameter that we're going to be looking at uh, as a transformation. We're going to keep that as something constant or fixed. So this might be a 2 to the power of x that we apply some transformation on. But c is going to be your base, your rate of increase or decrease. And in a way, we're going to consider this as a constant in a function. a is kind of your multiplier by your function, and this is still going to be your vertical stretch. This is going to have that same effect as it has in previous units. The b value is going to, um, again, be your multiplier on your input. This will be your horizontal stretch. As well, it could also be a flip. h is in a factored form, the addition subtraction aspect, and this is affecting your input. This is your horizontal shift. And lastly, after all this is calculated, there is this plus k this vertical shift that could move your entire function up or down. And this is your new notation which can feel a little bit overwhelming. Let's just try without being too accurate to maybe predict the effect of some parameter changes. First we can just ask, you know, what's happening, happening in a few of these. First thing, in 2 to the power of 5x, we're asking how have things changed from 2 to the power of x? Well, I see that 5, and that's a multiplier on the input. So I could say that this is a horizontal stretch by a factor of not 5, but a 1 -fifth. Again, we think backwards for those um, horizontal values. So this is going to have a very similar shape as a 2 to the x, but instead of its typical shape, we're going to say all the x values are being multiplied by a half. So it's going to appear maybe a little bit more skinny, and maybe it'll rise a little bit faster. x minus 5. Well, normally, we're traveling right through an x, uh, a y-intercept of 1. But we're, we're taking this graph, and we're moving it to the right. So we're not going to go through 1 anymore, and that's going to be a little bit unique. So for the first time, we're starting to see maybe the y-intercept isn't always 1. For letter C, 4 times 2 to the x. We're talking about a vertical stretch by a factor of 4. And so again, not going through 1. We're probably going to have this stretched up to go through a 4. And so this will appear to rise a little bit more quickly, perhaps. But it'll still level off to your horizontal asymptote. For little letter D, this time we've got a vertical shift up 1, and so for the first time we might be able to say, you know what, there is a horizontal asymptote, not that's the x-axis, we're not leveling off to the x-axis, we're leveling off to our new asymptote, which is really going to shift everything up, including your y-intercept, which is now going to go through a 2. So there starts to be this understanding that as everything shifts up, um, your asymptote does, your y-intercept does, and so does your, your range. And for one last one, uh, important to maybe remember that there is a factoring 
required to see the proper shifts for each. So to organize this, I know that there's a horizontal stretch by a factor of one half. There's a horizontal shift two to the right, and there's a vertical shift three down. So a rough idea of what this looks like. A horizontal stretch by one half will have a similar effect as letter A. So not really much unless we do this accurately, but it'll have a similar shape. A bit more squished together. Horizontal shift two to the right. So again, two to the right means we're probably not going to go through there. It'll be somewhere over here. And a, a shift three down. Ooh. So in a way, that asymptote is, is kind of giving us a good starting point for where this is going to travel. So it'll probably look something like this. But again, these points that we're aware of are not going to be as easy to determine unless we do this accurately. So we're starting to see a little bit of information being pulled out, and that's why it's important to maybe consider this a little bit more accurately, which we're going to do on the next page. So when we're graphing, um, we do have to first consider some base function. And I love to work with 2 to the power x, just because it's probably the simplest one we can deal with, but I get a little bit too used to that, and so it's important to maybe try something a little bit different. So what we're going to do is start with the transformation effects individually and represent them in mapping notation. So this time I'm going to choose 3 to the power of x because again we want to be able to do more than just 2 to the x and this is its own very different function. So we're first going to consider well what does 3 to the x look like? There are some points on this function. If you plug in a negative 1, um, a 1 third comes out. If you plug in a 0, a 1 comes out. 3 to the 1 is a 3, 3 squared is a 9, 3 cubed is a 27. And we could have gone further up to say what's happening if you plug in a negative 2 and a negative 1 and so on. and uh, Sorry, negative 2 and negative 3 and negative 4 and, and 4 and 5 and 6 and so on. But I think this gives us a decent idea of what we're dealing with. Now, what we are being asked to do is to vertically stretch by a factor of 2. And we're being asked to shift 2 to the right. So in a mapping notation, we can say that the x values are all shifting 2 to the right all the x values are moving up to. All the y values are being vertically stretched by a factor of 2. So if we want to do this accurately, we can say, all right, let's take all the points on the base function and apply this mapping notation to determine the brand new location of this function. So we have a negative 1 that is moving 2 to the right. We have a 0 that's moving 2 to the right a 1 that's moving 2 to the right. And quite quickly we can see that everything is really just 2 more than it was initially. The y values are all being doubled. So we have a 2 thirds, a 1 times 2, a 3 times 2, a 9 times 2, and a 27 times 2. And these are the values on our transformed function from 3 to the power of x. So if we sketch these, not all of them are going to be the easiest to see, but if we plug in a 1, a two-thirds should come out. If we plug in a two, a two should come out. Three, nine, and a 418 is already off the charts, so this is maybe as much as we could see. And there is y equals two times three to the power of x minus two. Mapping notation does help because Again, exponential functions can feel very foreign, and so this is going to be a helpful way to organize. One last one. Um, again, if you want to take a moment and pause the video and give this a try, it's a great idea. But we're going to deal with our base function. I see a base of 2. So we're going to start with a base of 2, which gives us some values like, uh, again, I'll start with a negative 1 just because I didn't give us a ton of, of choice. And so if you plug in a, a negative 1, a one half comes out. Plug in zero, one, two, four, and maybe there's enough space, but we'll see if we can fit a three comma eight. So we're gonna apply this transformation to see what happens to base two to the one half x minus three. I see the x values are all being stretched by a factor of two. Y values are all shifting down three. So we take our x values, double them.
y values, we take off 3. Ooh, a half minus 3. Not the easiest to do, but with a calculator, negative 2.5. 1 minus 3. Minus 3. 4 minus 3. All right, so we have a few values that we can now plot and see if we need more, but at a negative two, and it is stretching out horizontally by a factor of two, so the graph does move outwards. Um, so we have at a negative two, a negative 2.5. That's this shifting down three that's happening. I'm actually gonna draw a horizontal asymptote at the negative three, just to say, you know what, I know this new asymptote is here and I shouldn't really cross it, so there's a good structure to start with. At a zero, we're at a negative two. At a two, we're at a negative one. At a four, we're up to a one. Now maybe I should have one more point, but I'm a little worried that I'm gonna be off the grid, but that's okay. Um, if we have a three comma eight, two cubed, three comma eight, and we stretch this to a six comma eight minus three, six comma five, unfortunately, two, four, five, six comma five sits right there. So we can sort of see it on there, but uh, a larger grid would actually be kind of nice for one like this. But this is your graph of y equals two to the power of a half x minus three. And all of a sudden, map notation once again proves to be incredibly helpful. So with that, we're really gonna look at how to um, understand and interpret transform functions and their characteristics like domain, range, asymptotes, intercepts, as these are important. So you might do a quick sketch of what this roughly looks like just to make sure we sort of don't make any simple mistakes. I do see there's an a value that's a negative one. I know that this graph has flipped over. So in my head I'm already thinking it's kind of doing this. I know that it's shifting four to the right so it'll kind of just move over a little bit, not much will change, and then down two. I also know that after it does this, it's all shifting to a new, a new horizontal asymptote. So there's my rough idea of what this looks like. I know that this still goes forever left, forever right, so as a domain we can say x is such that x is an element of the real number system. As a range, I see everything is below this y value of negative two that we shifted down to. So I can say that the y values are such that y values are less than or ooh, not or equal to just less than negative 2 and every element of the real um, within that. Your asymptote, there is a horizontal asymptote that exists at y equals negative 2 and the y-intercept. Now a y-intercept is where we cross our y-axis. This happens at a very specific value when x hasn't moved left or right when x is zero. So if we plug in to this equation to figure out well what happens when x is zero, we have a little bit of math to do. We have a negative, and again this negative is not a part of the base, so we do have to leave that out. Negative three to the negative four minus two. We have a negative one over three to the four, subtract two, and we have a negative one over three squared times three squared, nine times nine is an 81. And so not the nicest number, but if we get a common denominator, we have negative one over 81 minus 162 over 81, common denominators. So negative one over 81 minus 162 over 81 gives us a negative 163 over 81. Some of you might have just looked at your calculator and said, uh, yep, I'm doing it there. That's okay. As a last try question, as a transformation, um, again, feel free to pause the video and see what you get. But I'm seeing a horizontal flip. So instead of going up like this, I might say it's been horizontally flipped to maybe go down. So maybe this is a decreasing function, vertically stretching by six and shifting up two. So, I know that it's gonna be decreasing, stretched up a little bit, but then going up too. So something like this, best guess. 
So I know that the domain kind of conveniently will always be everything left and right unless we're talking about some specific application. As a range, it's everything above, but not equal to, 2. Asymptote occurs at 2. And the y-intercept, nicely, is going to exist when x is 0. So we can say y is 6 times 0 0.75 to the power of negative 0. And we have a, anything to the power of 0 is a 1. So we have a 6 times 1 plus 2. Our y-intercept is going to occur at 8. And that kind of makes sense because there's no shifting. It's simply stretching it up to 6, and then we're shifting up 2. So a lot of these take a little bit of work, a little bit of logic, but sometimes a little sketch is uh, a quick thing to do. Uh, we continue our conversation about applications that we started last day, and we learn that there is some, um, again, base, which represents our rate of change. Sometimes you could be told that um, it's tripling, so you'd say 3, or it's doubling, so you'd say 2. By a factor of 5, you would say 5. And sometimes you could be told that it's increasing by 5%. So you can say anything above a 1 is increasing, so we could say increasing by 5%. We could say it's decreasing, starting with a 0, decreasing by 5%. We're keeping 95% of our value, but we're decreasing by 5%. P still represents the time for B to happen, and we'll look at this in a couple <laughs> examples. So if we were to talk about um, a bacteria culture of 50 cells doubling every three days, we can talk about starting value A, doubling every three days. And if you wanted to plug in some value into here, if you wanted to say two weeks, you'd have to say 14 as your x value, because this is days. An investment of, starting at $125, grows by 5% every nine days. X represents days. A coffee loses 18% of its heat every two hours losing 18%, we're keeping 82% every two hours. So T for time, X for input, whatever you want. And what's our starting amount? 100%. And we're losing 18%. It has all of its temperature. And maybe a, uh, a last little um, example before we finish things off. Um, instead of a class, petri, uh, class pet, you decide to have a class E. coli petri dish, and the astute math 30-1 class determines their growth under classroom conditions as exponential as follows. The first count, there are 40 cells. Four days later, there are 56 cells. Now, it doesn't specifically say 5% every four days, but it gi does give us a count. So we can first ask, well, what is the percentage increase? And we can calculate that. We didn't go up you know, 100%. We didn't go up 40 cells from 40. We only went up 16 cells out of the 40. And if we divide those two numbers, we do get 0 0.4 or 40%. There was a 40% increase. There was a 40% increase after four days. So as an equation, we can say we started at, at 40 cells, we increased by 40% after four days. And there's our equation. And maybe there's a certain amount that is, uh, that is considered an outbreak and you're looking for those values. But we can ask two different questions. How many cells will we have after two weeks? So I'll call this an x just because We'll, call, we'll do this on the graphing calculator in a moment. How many cells will we have after two weeks? Now, this is talking about something over four days, so we do have to talk about two weeks is 12, um, is 14 days. So we're going to plug in 14. So we can go straight to our graphing calculator, and we can plug in 40 times 1.4 to the power of 14 over 4. Be careful if you're on an older operating system that you might need to use brackets in your power position. And we end up with 129.86, or you'll end up with um, a y value of, we'll say about 100, um, 
30 cells. So you'll be very close to 130 cells after two weeks. So maybe that's a breakout, uh, an outbreak, maybe it's not. Lastly, how long will it take to reach 1,000 cells? This is an output. And so this is where we have to do a Y1, that's your output, a Y2, that's your equation, and we see where they meet. We actually have to wait until chapter 8 logarithms to be able to solve this one algebraically. So we can go to our calculator and we can type in 40 times 1.4 to the power of x over 4. 1,000 is your output, making sure our window settings are appropriate. I've got a y max that's a little bit more than 1,000. I've got a time that maybe goes up to 50. Maybe it needs to be more, not sure. But if we do graph this, we'll start to see there's the path of the bacteria, there's the 1,000, and a second trace intersect. First curve, second curve, guess gives us an intersection of about 38 days. So we could say that how long will it take to reach 1,000 cells? You could say about 38 days, partway through the 38th day. Maybe you even say, well, it won't be until the 39th day where we actually get that 1,000th cell. Um, it'll be partway through day 38. So there's a conversation differently there. But there is one more for you to try if you'd like to figure out how long it would take for an element that is often found in smoke detectors to reach 80 micrograms starting at 200 micrograms. Otherwise, there is some important practice on transformations and continued applications. Good luck.